Few people have had a more profound influence on popular culture and music than John Lennon. With Paul McCartney, he's one half of arguably the greatest songwriting partnership of all time. With the Beatles, he claimed to be more popular than Jesus, and he was one of the most famous anti-war advocates of his time, and his solo career spawned such time-tested hits that the merest mention of the word imagine is likely to make that song play in your head. In the summer of 1973, John Lennon's marriage with Yoko Ono was in trouble. They were reeling from the commercial and critical disappointment of Lennon's Ono produced sometime in New York City. And Ono had said that the constant hate their union drew was slowly ruining their careers and her vibes. Ono wanted a break from the whole she broke up the Beatles narrative and she needed one from Lennon too. Her solution? She set Lennon up with a mistress. To label a period of 18 months a lost weekend seems a stretch to many, but to John Lennon it marked a time of intense creativity, outrageous behaviour, a musical reunion with Paul McCartney and the breakup and reconciliation of his relationship with Yoko Ono. Lennon took the moniker for this period of self-introspection and productivity from The Lost Weekend, a 1945 film starring Ray Milland as an alcoholic writer struggling to overcome his addiction and return to his creative process. Beginning the summer of 1973 and lasting through until early 1975, Lennon's Lost Weekend marks the period of separation between himself and Ono. Four years into their marriage, the cracks were beginning to show and Lennon moved out, embarking on an affair with the couple's assistant, May Pang. Lennon and Pang split their time between Pang's New York City apartment and a house they rented in Los Angeles. Ono described what she felt during those days. I was very aware that we were ruining each other's careers and I was hated and John was hated because of me, she said. By 1973, she felt smothered. I started to notice that he became a little restless. So I thought it's better to give him a rest and me a rest. So she basically gave her blessing to John's affair. May Pang was a very intelligent, attractive woman and extremely efficient. I thought they'd be okay, Ono said. But it wasn't that simple. Unfortunately, Lennon's vision of the affair was overindulgent to say the least. The musician and Pang eloped to Los Angeles, where the suddenly wife-free Lennon started exercising all his bad habits, drinking heavily and generally going all or almost two years before he and Ono decided to start anew in 1975. While the musician did finish no less than three albums during this time known as The Lost Weekend, the creative process was usually booze-filled and bizarre. Away from Ono, Lennon began drinking heavily and abusing drugs. In LA, he teamed up with producer Phil Spector to record an album of rock standards that had inspired him. The guys were all drinking, and John was being one of the guys, Pang said in 2009. Everyone was as blitzed as he was. One of the bass players got into a car wreck, and we got kicked out of A&M Studios when someone threw a bottle of liquor down the console. Phil Spector was an American record producer, musician, and songwriter who is best known for his innovative recording practices and his sound and entrepreneurship in the 1960s, followed decades later by his two trials and convictions for murder in the 2000s. Spector developed The Wall of Sound, a production style that he described as a Wagnerian approach to rock and roll. He was regarded as one of the most influential figures in pop music history and one of the most successful producers of the 1960s. Spectre would also routinely arrive late to the studio, high on amyl nitrate, wearing elaborate costumes, one night a surgeon, the next a karate expert, with an ever-present pistol tucked in a hip holster. One night for a prank, Spectre fired the gun in the control room inches from the former Beatles' ear. An enraged Lennon yelled, Phil, if you're going to kill me, kill me, but don't mess with my ears, I need them. 
Another time, Spectre pulled his gun and chased Lennon through the hallways of the studio, screaming threats. When Spectre later disappeared with the master tapes, Lennon's label Capitol Records had to buy them back for $90,000. The rock and roll album, which Lennon called Jinxed, finally came out in 1975. Lennon later said of Spector, I'm fond of his work a lot. His personality, I'm not crazy about. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to remember this if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content. On March the 12th, 1974, Lennon and his drinking buddy, singer-songwriter Harry Nilsson were tossed out of the iconic Troubadour Rock Club in West Hollywood for heckling comedians The Smothers Brothers. I got drunk and shouted, Lennon reportedly recalled of the incident. It was my first night on Brandy Alexander's. That's brandy and milk, folks. I was with Harry Nilsson, who didn't get as much coverage as me, the bum. He encouraged me. I usually have someone there who says, OK, Lennon, shut up. Lennon fell victim to the drink after being introduced to the cocktail by Nilsson, arguably the biggest drinker in the whole of rock and roll. During this period in Los Angeles, there was a group of well-known celebrities called the Hollywood Vampires, Alice Cooper being one of them. Alice Cooper says the original Hollywood Vampires was a drinking club, a last man standing kind of thing. You'd go over to the Rainbow Bar and Grill in Hollywood every night and there would be myself, Mickey Dolenz from the Monkees, Bernie Taupin, Keith Moon and Harry Nilsson. If John Lennon was in town, he'd always be hanging out with Harry so he'd come by too. Everything became an argument. If John said white, Harry would say black. If John said Republican, Harry would say Democrat. I was the guy in the middle trying to referee these ridiculous arguments they would have. People started calling us the Hollywood vampires because we'd never see daylight. We figured instead of drinking the blood of the vein, we were drinking the blood of the vine. People might have started off in other places and then they just showed up, but the rainbow was the place where everybody would end up, so eventually they just gave us a room to ourselves because people were hassling us at the bar. All the guys who came in who were in bands got taken up to the loft and they called that the lair of the Hollywood vampires. As far as new members went, we knew who the big drinkers were, especially Keith Moon. We'd go there every night and get a head start because we wanted to see what Keith was going to turn up wearing. He would go to the costume shops around town and literally arrive dressed as the Queen of England. Then maybe two nights later, he'd come in as Hitler or wearing a French maid's outfit. We'd all sit around and laugh at him, but then you think, well, this guy's the best drummer in the world. He's allowed to do that. While the Troubadour incident sheds light on how wild Lennon could be during the Lost Weekend, not every moment was dedicated to debauchery. During this time, Lennon completed three solo albums, Mind Games, Walls and Bridges, and Rock and Roll. He also produced the Pussycats album for friend Harry Nilsson and wandered aloud about a potential Beatles reunion. As May Pang told it, John really thought about it at one point, and we were considering it early on in 74, just for the hell of it. Harry Nilsson wanted to be part of it. We said, oh, that would be a good idea, a one-off, and we would do it in the fall. We were thinking about upstate New York, like Syracuse, because Ringo couldn't be in New York City at that time. We had been hanging out with Ringo a lot in LA, and it just came out of conversation. Wouldn't it be great if we did this one gig? And they'd start talking about it. Yeah, why don't we do this? And George would do that and Paul would do this. So it was just thrown around and everybody was like, well, let's do that. In addition to his words to Pang, John had also spoken openly around that time about a potential Beatles reunion. So why didn't a reunion happen? According to Pang, none of the Beatles ever took the lead on hammering out the details. By 1975, John was back with Yoko at the beginning of a five-year break from the music business. Lennon was at times in the process of losing himself completely while he was away from Yoko during the Lost Weekend, though the decision to get back together with Yoko was his. May Pang supposedly encouraged John to reunite with Paul, something Yoko apparently didn't do. Still, every choice John made was his. 
but it was an impromptu jam session on March the 28th, 1974, that ignited rumours of a possible Beatles comeback. Lennon was at Birdbank Studios producing a single for Nilsson when McCartney and his wife Linda unexpectedly dropped by. I jammed with Paul, Lennon revealed in a later interview. I did actually play with Paul. We did a lot of stuff in LA. Though there were 50 other people playing, all just watching me and Paul. The session is the only known instance of Lennon and McCartney playing together between the breakup of the Beatles in 1970 and Lennon's murder in 1980. The tape of the session was released on the bootleg, a toot and a snore in 74, but produced nothing musically substantial. A reunion between the two was reportedly being discussed with Lennon planning to meet McCartney in New Orleans where the latter, along with his band Wings, would be recording the album Venus and Mars in early 1975. In her memoir, Pang wrote that Lennon was open to the notion. He kept bringing up the trip and each time he mentioned it he grew more enthusiastic, she said. But the anticipated meeting in New Orleans would never come to pass. Around the same time, Ono had talked to Lennon, requesting he visit their apartment at the Dakota in New York regarding a treatment she thought would end his nicotine addiction. Lennon, who said he spoke with Ono almost daily during his lost weekend, begged to be allowed to return home, would remain with his wife from then on. Their son Sean would be born in October 1975, Explaining their decision to reunite, Ono told Playboy in a joint interview with Lennon in 1980 that it slowly started to dawn on me that John was not the trouble at all. John was a fine person. It was society that had become too much. We laugh about it now, but we started dating again. I wanted to be sure. I'm thankful for John's intelligence, that he was intelligent enough to know that this was the only way that we could save our marriage. Not because we didn't love each other, but because it was getting too much for me. For Lennon, it was about reordering priorities, with the focus now being on the family. Especially with a new baby on the way. The number one priority is her and the family, he told Playboy. Everything else revolved around that. Taking on the role of house husband, Lennon focused on family and took a five-year hiatus from the music industry. In October 1980, he released the single Just Like Starting Over, ahead of the November release of his and Yono's album Double Fantasy, which at the time received mostly negative critiques. It would be Lennon's last studio album before his death the following month. Let us know your memories below of John Lennon's life. Do you have a favourite Beatles moment or perhaps a John Lennon moment after the breakup of the Beatles? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Remember this.